So now that we have kind of conceptual foundation for religion, I want to talk about religion in a little bit more sort of practical, grounded um, understanding. Uh, and so even though the sociology of religion is not theology, it's important to keep in mind some key definitions. Um, and then we, we, we briefly review um, uh, religion, um, uh, um, oops, excuse me, um, briefly review uh, uh, the major religions in a society. Um, and here, we'll talk about some of the largest religions. So Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. And this is just gonna be an important foundation for subsequent discussions. Judaism follows one God, who is the creator and ruler of the universe and who, view, who provides moral laws for humanity. The sacred text is the Tanakh, or sometimes referred to as the Hebrew Bible or the Torah. Um, uh, the three different words are in part because there are multiple forms of the um, sacred text for different kinds of communities and that depending upon whether or not you're in or not in the community, you call it a different thing. Um, so there's, it's not that there are like tons and tons and tons of different texts, but um, depending upon who you are, you call it something else. So for example, Christians call the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament, but the Jews would not call the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament because it's not the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew Bible. It's the uh, Tanakh or part of it, the Torah. Again, they follow one God who is viewed as the creator and ruler of the, of the universe, and that God provides a moral law for humanity. And one of the primary actions of God was to create um, the Israelites, or uh, to create a community of people um, who we now refer to as Jews. Christianity follows Jesus Christ and the Old and the New Testaments of the Bible. Um, so this means following the Hebrew Bible, um, uh, which the Christians refer to as the Old Testament, and then the New Testament. And the New Testament is made up of multiple different texts, um, uh, Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Gospels are the story of the life of Christ, um, along with other writings, like the writings of Paul, um, uh, who was a, a major interpreter of the life of Christ, um, but never himself met Christ. Orthodox uh, Christianity and Protestant definite, um, denominations combined with Catholicism make up the major Christian groups. Um, some groups consider themselves Christians that other Christians wouldn't consider Christians. So uh, uh, Mormonism is an example of that. I'm not gonna really get into that in, in this discussion. Um, uh, uh, Christians consider themselves a monotheistic uh, religion. So they have a trinity of um, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, that is God and Christ and the Holy Ghost, which are three in one. They are not three different gods. They are three of the same God. They are all one unity. Um, others outside of Christianity, sometimes uh, uh, feel as if Christianity is not a monotheistic religion, but um, uh, uh, in part because of the multiple different um, things of God and his son and the Holy Spirit. Um, but we as scholars take people seriously in terms of what it is they say they believe and uh, view Christianity as a monotheistic religion. Um, Islam follows one God that is called Allah, which is just the Arabic word for God, and teaching of his prophet Muhammad. Muhammad is just a man but is also a prophet um, chosen by God and spoken to by the angel Gabriel. The sacred text is the Quran. And um, um, there are among other uh, certain sects of uh, Muslims who are um, a, a part of the Islamic religion. Um, some of them uh, also read texts called the sayings of the prophet, that is things that the prophet said. But ultimately, the authority is in the Quran, um, uh, which is uh, the primary religious text. Islam is deeply tied to Judaism. Um, uh, the major uh, religious holiday in um, Islam celebrates um, uh, God's mercy, uh, and it celebrates God's mercy in the story of Abraham and Isaac. The story of Abraham and Isaac 
is a story where God um, uh, asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And um, this is a horrible thing to ask Abraham to do. Abraham goes and is about to do it to show his faith in God and God in his mercy stops Abraham. It's not forcing him to sacrifice Isaac. Um, and so one of the primary, the primary religious celebration in Islam is shared um, um, uh, uh, as a story in the uh, uh, Judaic tradition. So uh, deeply tied to it. Um, Muhammad uh, uh, as a prophet is just a man, so quite distinct from uh, Jesus, who is the son of God and part of the Holy Trinity, the singular God of Christians. Buddhism is a tradition where followers believe that they can achieve enlightenment through meditation, living simply, and working to gain wisdom. Um, here, the um, position of the divine, for example, is a little bit more um, uh, ambiguous. So uh, part of the reason um, we noted that uh, um, a religion doesn't always involve a belief in the divine is that many religious traditions don't actually have God in the sense of the Judaic and Christian traditions, um, where uh, here it's enlightenment that uh, uh, Buddhists attempt to achieve through meditation, living simply, and working to gain wisdom. Finally, Hinduism um, is a polytheistic religion, which means that there are multiple gods. And sacred writings are called the Vedas. Um, and there are different gods that tend to be associated with different kinds of people and different kinds of places. And the gods have personalities. Um, and um, uh, uh, Hinduism is quite an old uh, religious tradition, uh, similar to uh, Judaism. These different religions, uh, um, uh, if we look at their size of the different religions, we see that um, almost a third of the world is Christian. Um, uh, about a quarter, almost a quarter, are Muslims. Um, 15% uh, are Hindus, um, uh, Buddhists make up about 7%, 6% are folk religions. Um, Jews make up a very small proportion of the world, 0.2%, and 16.3% are unaffiliated, or they don't subscribe to any particular religion. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're atheistic, that they don't believe in religion, it's just that they don't subscribe to any particular religion. Folk religions are an um, umbrella category that include African traditional religions, Chinese folk religions, Native American religions, and Australian or Aboriginal religions. Um, this category um, is, in some people's view, a kind of problematic category, um, but it, it, it encompasses a range of traditional religions from Africa, Chinese, among the Native Americans, and Aboriginal um, people. As you'll see here, the sort of uh, um, two dominant religions are Christianity and Islam in terms of uh, population. And that those populations, those uh, religious experiences are distributed throughout um, uh, uh, the world in heavily patterned ways. So where the last slide gave you a sense of how big each of the religious religions are across the world, this map shows the majority religion in each country. Red represents Christians, the largest religious group in the Americans, in the Americas, most of Australia, um, uh, Europe, and Southern Africa. In the Middle East and the North Africa, Muslims are the largest group, represented here by green. In Israel, Jews are the largest religious group. And in China, most people are unaffiliated. Um, There's a large growing group of evangelical and Christians in China, over 100 million of them, but still most are unaffiliated. The largest religious group in India are Hindus, while Buddhism is the largest um, group in many parts of Asia. And what I want you to see here is in part um, um, the, um, excuse me, what I want you to see here is in part the heavy patterning and clustering of religion. You see Indonesia, which happens to, which is Muslim, and so it's sort of distant away from where most uh, Muslims are, um, which is in the Middle East and North Africa. But religions are not randomly distributed across the world. 
In fact, the spread of religions is a social process tied to the spread of religion um, uh, um, in social means. If we look at the United States, um, we see that in the US for every 100 people, two of them are Jews, one of them is Muslim, and 71 are Christians. Those Christians are made up of evangelical Protestants, um, mainline Protestants, and historically black Protestants, as well as Catholics. Mormons make up about 2% of the population, which is the same size as Jews. Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists are fairly small. And then unaffiliated are 23% of the American population. Um, so even though uh, um, uh, the largest religious group in the United States are Christians, the US is actually a very religiously diverse country in comparison to other countries. About half of the people in the US are Protestants and a fifth are Catholics, and about a quarter are unaffiliated. Um, um, but there are many important smaller groups of religious minorities. Now, one question um, that scholars have asked is whether or not such religious diversity can create doubts about religion. And so, you know, this is from uh, Peter Berger's work called The Sacred Canopy. Canopy. He argues that many religions create what he calls a plausibility crisis. Um, and Berger was a theorist of secularization. And he argued that being exposed to more than one religion, including religions that weren't your own, would erode people's faith and cause a significant religious decline. The thinking went something like this. If you have one set of beliefs, but then someone told you all of them were wrong, you might question what you believe. Having many different explanations could erode your faith in your own religion. And this leads to what Berger calls a possibility crisis. He said that your sacred canopy would be torn. And Berger uses this as one of the explanations for secularization, or why it is that throughout Europe and North America, there seems to be an increase in secularism for people who do not hold uh, religious beliefs, and where religion begins to lose its power and meaning in society. But that the United States is still a very religious place continues to surprise many sociologists, in part because it challenges, to a degree, Berger's thesis. It goes against the wisdom of the field. For a long time, sociologists predicted that religion would decline as society became more modern, more industrial, and more urban. So the idea is not necessarily that people become irreligious or that they lose their religion, it's that as societies develop, religion becomes less powerful and loses some of its meaning. So if you think about, you know, historically, um, the power of religion in different periods of time in Europe was much stronger. It had huge impacts on what it was that states did and how it was that people acted. And increasingly today, there's kind of this view that religion is less powerful could have meaning for people, but its meaning is isolated into the religious parts of their lives, and in other parts of their lives, religion isn't as meaningful. And sociologists had predicted, some based on Berger, but some based on other theorists, like the division of labor in Durkheim, or um, uh, Weber's idea of an increasing separate spheres of social life, that as things became more socially differentiated, as society became more quote unquote modern, as there was more industrialization in society and urbanization in society, we would have increased secularization where religion loses its power and meaning. And yet, if we look to the United States, we see that, you know, this doesn't quite seem to be the case, although maybe it is. So here we see a graph of church attendance from 1976 to 2014. And according to secularization theory, the more a society became urbanized, the more likely you were to meet people of different religions. And over time, as cities grew bigger and roads connected those cities, religion would fade in its significance. Evidence of secularization would include fewer people attending church over time. But the United States, I'll note, is still a very religious country, um, uh, contrary to the expectations. 
we can see that there's a slight degree decrease in the number of people or the percentage of Americans who go to church every week, but it's not very much of a decline. If anything, um, part of what's happening is that more people are reporting never having gone to church. And so the decline of the blue line is not very dramatic. It's you know, from like 28 to 24, 25%. It's not a huge decline over um, uh, uh, this 40 year period. Um, what seems to be happening is that more people are saying never. And one of the questions here would be, is it really the case that more people are never going to church or is it the case that it's more acceptable for more people to say that they're never going to church. What this points to overall is that the US is a more religious country than other places. That compared to many other countries, the United States is very religious. And many people claim that religious affiliation um, uh, uh, in the United States, many people claim to be affiliated. Um, so, um, many people in France, for example, might say that they're Catholic, but very few attend mass. In the United States, we have relatively high rates of religious attendance. Another way of thinking about this is you could say you're Catholic, but if you never go to mass, how Catholic are you? Um, is Catholicism part of your identity, but not part of your practice? In the United States, it seems people have religion both as part of their identity and as part of their practice. That is, in the United States, we have higher proportions of people who attend church every week than most other countries in this chart, with the exception of Ireland and Italy. So if, we look, if you look closely at this chart, what you'll see is um, that the US, at 36% of people who report having high rates of religious attendance, is very high in comparison to most other places. Um, within um, the developed world. So uh, Norway, it's only 7%, Sweden, 6%, Greece, only 16%, Australia, 17%. In the US, it's 36%, um, quite high. You'll also note that in the developing world, um, rates of religious attendance tend to be higher. So Uganda, the rate of weekly religious attendance is 82%, incredibly common. Throughout much of the Muslim world, it's quite high. In Indonesia, 72%, Egypt, 62%, in Turkey, even 44%. Um, but this shows us uh, uh, some, just how kind of, in some, some ways kind of dramatically different the United States is from Europe in its patterns of religious attendance. Excuse me. Um, now, one way to think about this is about the idea of religious competition. And um, Roger Fink and Rodney Stark sought out to explain why the, the US stayed so religious for so long. And what they concluded challenged some of the assumptions of secularization theory. What Fink and Stark argued was that having many religions didn't lead to a plausibility crisis, as Berger suggested. Instead, when there were many religions, they compete with each other for members by actively marketing themselves, by offering services for particular populations, for example, in a different language or for a specific age group, such as teenagers, or by offering daycare for younger parents. Having more active religious groups makes religion more attractive and thus makes people more likely to, become, to stay involved and become involved with a religious organization. This is sort of a very, like it's an interesting kind of like capitalistic argument about religion. And it's, it's basically the idea that in France where everyone's Catholic, there's not a lot of religious competition. And so the church doesn't have to do much for everyone to remain Catholic. But in the United States, when you have many different religious traditions, different kinds of churches, different kinds of Protestant churches, different kinds of Catholic churches, but it's all, also different kinds of religions offer things to people in a practical sense. So they may provide language uh, uh, masses in, in Mandarin Chinese or Cantonese or Spanish or um, Portuguese. And by doing that, make religious participation more attractive. They may have events for older people or for younger people, for people who are looking to get married or people who've recently been married and need daycare for their children. 
And so religious competition that you see in the United States, where there are many different active religious groups, many different active churches, leads to an increase in religiosity. It's the opposite argument of Berger, where Berger says competition is going to undermine religion. Here, with this argument, um, uh, what we see is something exactly the opposite, which is that competition actually makes religions more responsive to people's needs. Now, people tend to worship when they do worship with people like themselves. So uh, researchers in the sociology of religion have begun to point out that religion is a key part of the social organization of society, especially in diverse societies. In fact, religion is highly correlated with race, ethnicity, and social class. So people worship with people who have similar levels of education, similar racial and ethnic backgrounds, and similar political beliefs. There are such things as black churches in the United States, which means that there are churches that are primarily for and almost exclusively for the black community. Less spoken about, but equally true, is that there are white churches, churches primarily for white people. This shows how religion reflects and even perhaps participates in a social organization of society. Different religions intersect with inequality in different ways. Think of some religions where people tend to be poor. And you can think of other religions where believers tend to be wealthier. Religion is therefore an important indicator or indication of inequality. In fact, in the United States, we can rank religions, and I don't mean better or worse rank, I mean we can just see differences between them according to their class background. This chart shows the proportion of members in each religious group who have at least a bachelor's degree. And we can see that some groups have much more education than others. As a whole, more than half of Jewish persons age 25 and older have a four-year college degree. But among Catholics, only one quarter of the members do. Among black Protestants, a religious tradition composed of historically African-American dominations, less than a fifth have a college degree. What we see in this then is that education or, or rather religion is deeply clustered or patterned where Hindus have some of the highest rates of education. This is a story of immigration. Um, and black Protestants have some of the lowest. It's important to note that this is not a causal argument. It's not an argument that religion causes mobility. Um, or instead, or that, uh, it could be the case that mobility leads to religiosity. So, uh, or in other words, like it's not that being Hindu gives you a bachelor's degree, or that being um, Muslim means that you're it's causally determined by this. Um, important to the story of Hindus is the story of immigration. So, um, immigration of Indians into the United States has often been limited to Indians with a college degree. So if you limit Indians to migrating to the United States as those Indians with a college degree, so if you're recruiting doctors and engineers as an example, then all of your Hindus are going to be people with four-year college degrees, and they're also going to be a particular subset of people whose children are likely to get college degrees because they had college degrees. So part of the story here is not that being Hindu makes you more educated or that being more educated makes you um, more likely to be Hindu, the history of immigration in America is deeply important to this story. It's also deeply important to, to, to it's not so, solely uh, responsible for the story, but it's deeply uh, uh, tied to the story. Um, and so, so uh, uh, a second part of this uh, that's important to note is that immigrants, while they're expected to assimilate into the United States, are typically not expected to assimilate religiously. If we look beyond the case of Hindus, what we see is that because of immigration, Catholics are a very heterogeneous group. Some come from Ireland, Italy, and Latin America. Catholics in the 20th century were mostly from Ireland and Italy. And although they were discriminated against at the time, Irish and Italians have become 
white. They have joined the sort of group of power in the United States, the white group, and have achieved, on average, middle class status. However, they're Catholics from other races, as shown in the chart a few slides ago, are mostly Latino in origin. They are recent immigrants from South and Central America and have far less education than white Catholics today. And so we shouldn't, when looking at the graph of religion and say um, uh, education, draw too many conclusions in part because of a lesson that I've taught a long time ago. That when we look at differences between groups, we need to remember that there's almost always more variation within groups than between groups. Not always, but almost always. And so Catholics are a, are a good example of this because within different religious groups, there's an enormous degree of heterogeneity. Finally, I'll say that religion, immigration is also a key factor for non-Christian religions. Many immigrants are, been, are Buddhist and Hindus, and because of new immigration laws, they're among the most educated Americans. Immigration continues to shape religion in the United States. Since 1967, U.S. policy has limited immigration for many countries, and people with high levels of education and in-demand skills are given preference for migration. As a result, we have many immigrants who are highly privileged and who bring their religions with them. And so many Buddhists and Hindus in America are highly educated because of immigration policies that favor educated individuals. I'm gonna stop here and we'll return to these lectures um, uh, on religion to talk more generally about other patterns within uh, religion, sort of practically on the ground, focusing a little bit more on the United States.